Hi, I'm comedian Lunga Chuka, the Energizer Funny, streaming live with my special guests on The Price of Fame Podcast. We feature entertainment professionals on the show and find out what sacrifices were made to reach their level of success. Look forward to learning about how our guests have overcome mental health challenges, achieved success breakthroughs, what you need to know about the industry, and how you know when you actually have a talent that needs to be shared with the world. Take these episodes as your personal mentorship guidance on how to be a successful entertainer. We chat to those who have made it in South Africa and abroad. Let's make the SA entertainment industry the most supported by locals because local talent is liquor talent. Subscribe now to keep up to date. You can also find us on all social platforms. Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of The Price of Fame. This is episode 19, season two. My name is Lunga Chuka, and I'll be your host. Tonight's guest, ladies and gents, is a well-renowned and accomplished actress and businesswoman. She started her career back in 2001 and has occupied the South African entertainment industry as a successful uh, freelancer over the, for over 21 years, ladies and gents. But probably most of you recognize her from the hit TV shows such as Issy Dingo, Siva Delan, and Bernal Landers, just to name a few. But tonight, we get to meet the woman behind the success. So without further ado, ladies and gents, please welcome to the screen, Miss Kim Clutter. <laughs> Hi. How yes. are you? <laughs> I'm good, thanks. How what are you? What an introduction. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. If you ever need me to introduce you anyway, I don't know if you're going out somewhere, if you're going to family functions, you just bring me out and I'll... <laughs> introduce me introduce me to my family i like that i like that idea i know you know who she is but you don't know her like i know her i'll write up a whole script <laughs> yeah. this evening. say again how are you doing this evening Ms. i am good i'm good um this is actually i'm i'm very new to the world of podcasting so I'm yeah, sorry yeah. For, my <laughs> for my technical glitches this evening. Um, but this is my second one for the day, and I'm actually quite chuffed. So oh, okay, I'm quite. very excited to be a part of yours this evening. Yeah. Some stuff. Look, it's a real honor to have you on the show tonight, honestly. I mean, a lot of us recognize you from TV, and we always just see the glitz and the glamour. So it's quite exciting to get an opportunity to hear from you where you started, you know, how you started, who was your influences and just learn about all of your lessons and hopefully just be inspired, you know? So that's the way that we're going. That's the journey that we're going with tonight. So I hope you're absolutely comfortable with that. Um, yeah. Other than super, super excited to get to know you and it's an honor to have you on the Price of Fame. So thank you so much for agreeing and allowing yourself to be, allowing us to have you as a guest on the Price of Fame. It's a real Such honor. a pleasure. Such a pleasure. Thank you. Okay, cool. So before I move into my questions, you, um, so with season two, it's, we've done something a little different now uh, where we allow guests because they always have questions and the questions always appear like afterwards because I don't like to be distracted with what they ask. So with season two, we've done something different where we've got now our, we've moved our platform to a streaming to uh, um, audio platforms as well. So with Anchor FM, uh, we have this feature now where people can send us voice notes and they'll ask questions through other voice notes. So we have a voice note for you tonight. And uh, don't worry, okay. we scan those before we, before we approve them, you know, so that we don't have anything <laughs> strange. 
so we have a voice for possibly a fan, and they probably have a question for you. So we're going to play that first, and then we'll get okay. into my question. Cool. Okay, cool. cool. Hi, Lunga. The Price of Fame is really an awesome and wonderful show. I really enjoy it. I just have one question for Kim. How is it to be a businesswoman in today's society with generational changes? Sure. Deep immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, like <laughs> okay. Okay, so when I was at when I was at university, see, I get confused about what side is the right side. Okay, I've got it now. So when I was at university and I was studying accounting, we had to do a project on um, the woman's um, position in the economic change in South Africa, and this was post dispensation. Um, I think the role of women it's it's changed dramatically. Um, we are obviously now starting to engage a space where we become, well, where we are seemingly equal to our counterparts, and that's that's the male energy, the patriarchy. Um, I think the, the most important thing to remember that if you are a female occupying a professional space in terms of economics is to discard the idea of competition. We are not here to compete with men. We bring something very different to the table. And I think it's important that we kind of stay focused on that. Um, how females run companies and how they captain industries are very different to how men do it. And neither is better or worse than the other. But as long as we start understanding that our power is a, it occupies a very different space, um, women intrinsically come from a very nurturing space. And like I've always said, you know, the one thing that this country needs is a female president. Um, and, I, and I think it's important for young female South Africans to understand that. So, you know, when I come from the generation where we, we, uh, it was past the baby booming phase and women just wanted to economically thrive. But now we are starting to engage a space where women are now okay with the fact at, at being mothers, being mothers, and oh, this year of mine, sorry, at being mothers, but also understanding how important it is to feed themselves in terms of what their ambitions are. So there's a very fine balance. In Ikdunk, I don't know. I, I think I think if your if your approach to it is appropriate in terms of what it is you want from the experience, then it will be what it needs to be. But the minute you start occupying a space where you want to be better or you want to compete, um, yeah, you're going to fall short a little bit as 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 a woman because we are not quite there yet. We are almost there. We're on our way there, where we start earning equal salaries for doing the same job. And I think if you keep your eye on the ball, um, it's gonna, it's really gonna bode you well. Does that answer that question? Good about the whole, how, like when you speak about um, how women handle things, you know, and how men handle things, the masculine, the energy and the feminine energy, you know, and it's like you're saying, it's not good to, as a woman to try and, do the whole competing, you know, because that's more of the masculine way, you know, and women come in with a completely different, like you're saying, nurturing nature and all of that. So intuitively driven. So the mindset, everything is completely, mm -hmm. different, you know, works a lot. And I think, I think honestly speaking, I think this is the future of business as, it, as we see it. It's no longer cutthroat. It's no longer that. It's, it's, it's the more holistic approach we have to business, the more you start understanding what it means to have an employee be invested in whatever it is you're selling, the better of your, your, your company will become. And I think women are really at the forefront of doing that holistic approach to employment in terms of corporate wellness. So, yeah, that's anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Went deep, went deep right from the beginning, but that's what they wanted, you know, and we give the people what they want. Uh, okay, so for me, I would like to know, 
can you take me back to the very, so like I said, like in the bio, you know, um, you started your career in 2001, but I know that's not when it started truly for you, you know, as Kim, you know, the time when you got inspired by the industry and all that. So please take us back to that very beginning, you know, paint the picture for us. How old were you? Where were you living? You know, when the bug bit you and you told yourself, this is what I want to be one day when I grow up. So here's the really interesting thing. Um, I never had any dreams of becoming an actress. Okay. I studied accounting at UCT um, and I was going to finish my degree up in WITS. Um, I think the bug bit long before I knew it was a bug and long before I knew I was bit. Um, yeah. So my great grandfather taught me to read at the age of four. I grew up in Bontiaville. My family came from the Group Areas Act, which was in 65 from Sea Point. And I grew up with my great grandparents. Um, and my great granddad, the, the biggest gift anyone has given me was the ability to read. And I started reading at the age of four. So my world was very big, very young. Um, and you know, when you grow up in, in communities on the townships or on the Cape Flats, Prescription is a very big part of your life. It's like you finish school, you get a job at the factory, you marry a guy, you put up a Wendy house, you have a couple of kids, and when you've grown up, you have your own house. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. Yeah. But it was not what I, I knew that I wanted something different. Not better, different. So... I think I was a storyteller from a very young age because I was hooked on books. I was hooked on stories. I loved telling stories. I was a very shy child, believe it or not. I, <laughs> I could barely <laughs> greet people. Um, and I think, I think when I moved up to Joburg, um, I, I followed love to Joburg and the person that I was that I was in a relationship with, he was an actor. So I started moving in the acting fraternity up here. And it was really by fluke. It really was by fluke because I was supposed to finish my accounting. And um, about, unfortunately, he passed away in the first year we were here. So I had to kind of find my feet and, but in the first year I was here, I landed my first TV gig as a presenter. And about, I think it was about a, a year after, after his death that I was approached to audition for a part. And I said no three times. I said, no, I'm not an actress. I was living with my foster parents, Ivan and Vanette, and they're both actors. And I see what these people do for a living and how they do it. And it's hard work. And I was like, nope, sorry. And then my agent eventually said to me, Kim, just go. What do you have to lose? Just go. Just go and give it a shot. And so I did and I got it. And I'll quickly tell you, I'll quickly give you a rundown of when I got bit. Um, yeah. So the, the, the storyline was I was dating a drug dealer. I, I lived on a farm with my mother who ran the farm with the, the owners with three brothers. So I dated a drug dealer. I found out he was a drug dealer. Then I went into an affair with one of the brothers. I felt pregnant. Then I find out the guy I had the affair with is actually my biological father. Then I go for an abortion and then I try to commit suicide. Wow. And so when I finished, that was my first acting gig. And when I, when I finished that story, I realized that, um, yeah, this is what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. And I haven't yeah. looked back since. Yeah. Uh, has, it, has it been a smooth transition uh, all, the, all the way? Or do you feel like you had some challenges, you know, especially with trying to convince yourself? I mean, like you said, you, you, you studied something else completely, you know, and you, you probably had your eyes set on a completely different journey. And now with, I'm shifting over. Was it an easy shift like that for you? Or did there, was there some challenges maybe with family or your community with you having the shift? I was very independent from a very young age. So mm -hmm. I was not answerable to anyone at that yeah. point in my life, um, with all due respect, but I wasn't. And I, I, I think it wasn't a difficult transition because I was already there. I just didn't know it. 
I had a different name for it. So my, my form of creativity was numbers. I love numbers. So that was my expression of my creativity. But what, what, what was very evident was my love for people and my studying of people and, and my, my curiosity of human stories. So it was already there. I just, I, I just didn't, I, I didn't name it. I just thought, oh, this is my personality. So <laughs> this is what it is. So when it happened, it wasn't even a transition. It was just a gliding into. It was very simple. It was very, because it was a moment of truth. Yeah. And when you hit yeah. moments of truth, there's no difficulty. Very true. And like well, with your acting journey, you know, with learning and going through the through the motions because I don't know if you said that you studied acting or not or did you just go straight into it you know so like so, sometimes we can go step acting with a lot of habits you know were there any habits that you needed to unlearn in the beginning of your acting career that was kind of like um not so good for your acting no or were you just or were you one of those person people that actually you know it's it's just a gift for some people you know you know you just just have it, you know, you don't have to go for school or anything like that. Some people just have the gift. Or were you one of those people? So so a word I, I like to throw around because it makes me sound so intelligent is the word <laughs> autodidactic. <laughs> so autodidactic <Whoa>! means <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> write it out. Autodidactic. Um so wow. what autodidactic means it, you are self-taught. So I never mm. studied acting. But I studied acting on the floor with really amazing actors, very generous actors. In terms of in terms of habits, and you know, did I find it difficult? So some people some people call it talent, some people call it a career. Um, for me personally, as I see it today, twenty one years later, for me it's a calling. I. Yeah. I, I had very little choice. I just had to answer to the ancestors and to whoever's above. And I had to, I had to follow a journey that was, that was destined to be mine. Um, it just, you know, sometimes you ask for things in life and you say, oh, I want this. And then you think it's going to arrive in the color pink, but then arrives in the color blue and you don't recognize it as the actual thing you asked for. And it was very similar to mine. I wanted to change lives always. I always wanted to be impactful. I was always very passionate about stories, about culture, about the sense of humanity. And believe it or not, I honestly thought I could do that through my love for numbers, but it was, no, it, all, all, all that my love for numbers did was lead me to my gift or whatever you want to call it to tell stories and i i tell um i tell hard stories <laughs> i very seldom get comedies <laughs> yeah <laughs> i got a comedy now i'm busy with a comedy now but i okay. very seldom get comedies my husband says to me he says oh gee please man can we now just can we just do funny now for a little bit because it's <laughs> it takes its toll on you when um when you so when you're not technically trained you pull from a different source and so i more than often pull from my own life experiences and more often than not my life imitates my art and vice versa so it becomes deeply personal for me and so anyone anyone that is witness to that it's it's not an easy gig um, and so my my partner and my husband, he's like, I was doing a play not so long ago and I was playing a schizophrenic. And after two weeks, because I, I love a little bit of method. And after two weeks, he said, OK, mm -mm, snap out of it. Uh -uh. You give her an hour and a half at the theater. You give another hour to debrief and then you come home. I don't want Joni to come home. You come home, because if this is what's going to happen to you, then you mustn't act anymore. So, um, so it's really just hitting that balance, I think. Yeah, but it's a calling. It's not a, it's not a career for me. 
Yeah. No, I mean, I like I can't ignore the fact that you just mentioned that it does take a toll on you because uh, you're probably the third actor that I'm speaking to now and speaking about how the effects, you know, especially sometimes when the roles that you have to play intertwine with what you've experienced in your actual life, you know. So we were speaking about it. We were like actually saying that it would be nice if like production um like would have like what on set there if they would have like therapists you know just to help help the actors debrief especially when they're playing like real um real stories you know and real challenging stories that a lot of people probably haven't really overcome yet you know so it might be real and it might trigger people it might even trigger the actor too so yeah we also spoke about yeah especially when it comes to real stories like that it, Maybe, you know, producers should consider having maybe a therapist on um, on the payroll, you know, for that period of time just to help us. Debrief. You know, yeah. Yeah. Very important to debrief, you know. I mean, like you're saying, you don't want to take that energy home, you know, because it might affect your family back at home. And you don't want to do that with something that you love and something that you're absolutely good at, you know. You don't want it to be a negative effect to the people closest to you. So, and yeah. So so this is this is kind of my thinking about it. So my foster mom said to me the one day, she's an actress as well. She said to me, baby, I think maybe you should consider dating maybe a plumber or a pharmacist. <laughs> and I said to her, you know what, Ma? I so my partners in my life, they've all been in the arts or in the creative sphere or, or forum and, or spectrum. And I, I cannot imagine having to explain what I do or where I have to go or what it is I need to access in order to tell stories to someone else. I can't, I, the minute I need to have to explain that, then, yeah. Um, yeah then then I'm it's lost already so i'm very fortunate to to be with the most amazing man who is in the arts he is he's an incredible actor and voice artist and it's a lekker mens man maar dit is iemand wat he's older and so he has learned what i am still learning and Absolutely. so it's it's wonderful when someone can witness your journey and also just go cool go 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 okay let's just re let's just recalibrate quickly yeah um so i don't think i don't think that i don't think it's so when you talk about the, the fact that you know you need maybe it will be a good idea to have psychologist on a set when you're telling really hard stories that would be amazing um we are very far from that um in our industry you still have producers paying actors 2,000 rand a call after being in the industry for 20 years. This is this is what we are dealing with as artists. So, so the holistic approach to having support in terms of debriefing is, I think the onus is going to be on the actor to make yeah. sure that you stay healthy and you have someone that you can talk to. Yeah. I was actually going to ask, my next question was about to ask that is, I mean, like you said, you've been in the industry for over 21 years. So you've seen some changes and you've seen a lot of transitioning and you know what it looked like back then and what it is now. In your own yeah. experience, your own journey, with the changes that you've experienced, has it changed for the better or do you think it changed for the worse? Sure, that's a very difficult question. It actually it isn't. It's just really hard to answer because we don't like the answer. It's no, it's not changed for the better. Um, well, not not from an actor's point of view. Um, I think also you know post COVID, COVID, COVID brought so much. The ripple effect of COVID has been devastating to our industry, as you very well know this, um, to our life our live concerts, our live performances. I mean, those guys had to, I have friends now who are, who were at the top of the game and they've had to diversify and go into corporate SA just to make a living. Um, the unfortunate thing about where we are at now as an industry is that they are, they are producers who exploit artists at this stage of the game. 
Um, not many. I mean, some some are so f far more um, accessible post this human crisis we uh, this global crisis we had gone through. But and then you get the guys who poach um, in in the worst possible way. And just like I mentioned now, you know, you get these guys, you get these massive contracts, and then yeah. literally people that's been in the industry for over twenty years. They get offered two thousand rand a, a day, and you know what? And I and I'm saying this because I think it's time that artists and actors start speaking about what they get paid. We were taught in this country that you can't talk about your rate because it's so unprofessional. I call. We need to start talking about our rates because what actors are being offered now, I earned fourteen years ago. This wow. is where we're at. No, it's 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 the biggest insult, and I think, I think we are at a at a point now where, um, as artists, we need to people just need to be held accountable. And I, it, I think I'm at the place and at the stage of my life now where, I am, I'm tired of giving that reality my silent consent. So now I'm talking out. I'm naming people. I'm saying how it is. It's absolute. It's 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 ridiculous, because we are the storytellers. We we are the mirrors to society. We have a very important role. The people who take their craft seriously. The people who don't buy into the celebrity wop wop whatever that might be. And so I um I'm very saddened by the state of of our industry. Um. There are people who still truly, fully commit their lives and everything. But I can tell you now, the artists who are truly, fully committed to the craft, they're struggling, man. They're struggling. Hmm. Look at our beautiful Charlene, the conditions she went in on her last days. It's, it's, it's unacceptable. It really is. And people should start be held. They need to start being held accountable for it. So I guess no Mukhan still blame on. Yeah. You know? Yeah. We have, we have to unfortunately the only people who's gonna change it are the people who's involved, and that's us as actors and people and creatives, you know, because nobody's gonna come in and save us or do it for us, you know. So we'll have to change that wheel. And with with that being said, what what changes do you feel that you've now seen that should be implemented in our industry? That could help, that could really help actors or just creators on in a in a on a general pl um, platform. Or you can just speak about actors because obviously you have what you've experienced. So what do you think? What changes needs to be taking place that can improve our industry? Because I don't know, like with with sport, the industry is quite different in different countries. Like with dance, you know, with some dance, like some countries is involved and fully involved with certain things, and some countries know it's got you on your own. So I know sometimes with the industry with different places it differs like that. So what have you experienced that you feel certain changes that could be implemented that will really make it a successful experience for actors? I think I think that firstly you require courage. Because yeah. it's such a fickle industry, it's such a fickle business, because you will say no to five rand, but then there's someone behind you that will say yes to four fifty. You see? And so I, I think, firstly, we need to create some kind of uniformity, some kind of standard. I think we need to have more conversations, honest conversations as creatives. And that's across the board. That's writers, directors, your actors, um, your crew. Come on. I mean, and so, and I think what the thing is, is that, you know, it's like a broken telephone. The doesn't know what the other one is doing and how it's affecting the collective. So, for instance, a producer will employ certain measures um, to a set, but the channel that's commissioned that producer is maybe not aware of what is actually happening on the ground. And so it's really starting to open up those channels of communication where people know exactly what's happening because everyone's name is attached to it from your, from your writers to your director to your artist to your channel. And the person in the middle is the producer who brings all of this together. And unfortunately, unfortunately, 
And it's not a lot because I can tell you now, most production companies that I have worked with lately or in the last few years have been so progressive. They've really tried to come to the table, but there are one or two rotten, rotten potatoes that is, mm, they, are, they are setting a very bad standard, a very bad standard. And people are too scared to talk about it because we need the work. We yeah. must now need the work. So we can't talk or we still play. And so I'm kind of past that point now because, yeah. because I, I, I think also just as someone that's engaged the industry for 21 years, I have, I have a, a moral responsibility to go, I don't want to leave the industry in the state that it is for the kids who coming, who, who's coming behind us. No, I don't. I want to know that I've at least done what I think I could have done, the best I could have done to ensure that there is a safe landing for them when they arrive here as storytellers. And, and they, I'm going to call it, they are dinosaurs that must go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's I'm not feeding our industry, it's not cultivating, it's not preserving, it's not nurturing, it's just outdated. And it's really, it's killing the spirit I have so many active friends that have left the industry because of people like that and good people, good actors, because of producers like that. And it's now, it's now it's time, man. It's time. I'm sorry. No, no, no absolutely. And I believe you speak for a lot of people. That's why you, you, it's, you're being affected that way because it's not just what you're experiencing, it's what a lot of people are experiencing. And like you said, it's kind of like you've been manipulated by the you can't speak, you know, otherwise you'll lose your position. So that just puts you in a more difficult position to just have to roll over and accept. But you are the one who's making this whole, you're the one who, who actually sells the, the movie or the series or everything. You're the one who makes it happen. People buy into the character. They buy into you, how much you perform and all of that. So it's just yeah. only fair if you actually get properly you know fairly compensated for what you bring you know because how you sell the picture is that you know you're the backbone of basically the direction and the growth of the episode of the mm -hmm. series so it's mm -hmm. only fair that the guy should be treated well you know as and so so here's the thing Lunga. um and i understand we are in a bit of a um, recession i get that all industries are but so the example I made earlier on about established established actors, two thousand rand a call. This is the offer which I earned 14, 14 years ago, and back then it was even little. It's not even about that. It's about the disregard. It's about the disregard for what value it is we bring to a production. It's about yeah. not being acknowledged. It's about not being seen. It's about the absolute exploitation. And I am just so bored. I'm so bored of it. And so we need to start naming people and we need to start talking about our rates. We need to start discussing it amongst each other so that we can see what is actually happening, so that there can be some form of transparency. But what it does to the spirit of an actor when you are offered that, when you know what your investment is going to be, not even, not even the, the, the value in terms of marketing, but just the investment as an actor, as a storyteller to the product or the production, when you're being offered that, then you have to be better than you. Yeah. And that's insulting. Yeah. Absolutely. Um. Can you give us before we just before we log off? Uh, can you give oh, us? Oh no, we some... gotta end on a positive note here. <laughs> yes, so I was gonna ask you, like, can you give us some of your most iconic moments where you're like in your acting, where you're like, oh my word, that I wish I could relive that, or some a moment when you got to meet someone you really looked up to, you know, and act with that person. Can you share some of those well, moments? That... One. For the books. I remember one of the first moments I had when I moved to Joburg which was very, um, a wow moment for me. I met Ntati Mushesh 
And I remember okay. I was, she was on Sea of the Line and my partner, my late Mark partner was on the, he was part of the cast. So I met her at a party one night and I was, I couldn't talk. I was so <laughs> starstruck. I was like, what is going on? And then I met Vilna Sneeman and then I get to work with Hans Stradom and then I live with, with Vinette and Ivan. So I have all these major highlights. But I think I can honestly say, mm, in terms of a highlight for me, I'm trying to think now. One of the big highlights for me in my industry, believe it or not, was um, I was working at Bernalandes at Stark Studios. And there I see this icon of a man, this person I grew up with, this person we all grew up with. And I look at him and I go, oh my goodness, my heart is thumping and I want to go and I, I want to go, hello, I want to go hello, um, <laughs> but I'm too scared. <laughs> but before I could say anything, he comes up to me and he says, oh, my machtig, oh, jy maak mooi, kan ek toch a kiki met jou neem? I'm like, what? Rian Kreewagen, true story. <laughs> I'm like, well, Marianne, are you asking me for a photo? Are you kidding me? I want a photo with you. So those, I've had so many beautiful moments in my in my work. I've had yeah. the, I've had the fortune of of telling really good stories from being a sex slave to being a schizophrenic. Um, yeah. And and I I always say, you need to maintain the integrity of the person that has actually gone through it. And that Absolutely. is your that is your responsibility as an actor and as a storyteller. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. Um, <laughs> and before I end it off, I have to ask you my final question that I ask all my guests. Okay. And um looking forward to how you're gonna answer this one. So okay. with this in my time machine, right? And in this right. time machine, get back to a very young version of yourself, maybe a time where you needed some advice or some guidance you know when you just felt like you're a little bit of a little bit lost you know in time there's a younger version of you and it's the kim of today who have learned the lessons that you have learned you know walk the journey and has the wisdom and you have five minutes to give the younger version of you some advice what would that be you know it's interesting i asked someone the same question today about themselves i promised you i wow. i asked the actual question so <laughs> <laughs> it's such a sure um what i would say to young kimmy i would say to her i would say to her breathe little one i would say to her you are enough i would say to her that you're not alone i would say to her i have your back and i would say to her keep on knowing the knowing that you have inside of you, you don't need to explain it to anyone because you know your truth. Um, and all I wanna do with the, with the young Kimmy, and I, I think about it now in my 40s and I go, yes, I was a lekker kind. Oh, you were such a lekker kid, man. She was so easy. She, she was disciplined, she was academic, she was kind, she was obedient. So I was a lekker kind, but, she didn't fully, truly understand what it meant to be herself. Mm. I get to show her that now. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. Well, yeah. What a way to... <laughs> I love that. On a happy yeah. note. <laughs> Thank you so On much. On a happy note. Thank you so much for sharing your journey with us and we've learned so much from you tonight as well and we really hope that a lot of people who need to watch the conversation was watching this conversation and learned also about yes. that as well but thank you so much for um you making yourself That's available for today. truly 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 appreciate it and hopefully yes. one day we can share the the stage together you know i'd like all the set together hopefully hopefully I'd love that. I'd love that. And I just, I want to say to you guys, thank you for your professionalism. Thank you to Saskia too. Um, you've made it really easy. Sorry, I didn't know what StreamYard was, but I figured it out now. But thank you yeah. so much for for just being on top of it. I really appreciate that. Thank you and so much. And all the best. Let's share a set together. Yes, yes. Let's do that. Let's do that. Lovely, lovely. So thank you so much. <laughs>
the best for Pleasure. the future journey going forward and we love to look for oh yeah so we want to just look forward to what you're coming up with next so please drop us your social handles where can we find you and just be part of your journey okay cool so you can get me at kim underscore Kluter on instagram and then kim Kluter on facebook I, yeah i think that's what it is and then you can also get um, what i'm busy with now on youtube which is the microcosmic kitchen movement so that's my my latest new um philanthropic movement that i started during COVID. yeah okay that's it i think oh and kim.a.cluter at gmail.com if you want to book me for mc work or motivational talking <laughs> thank you so much kim thank you for um with us tonight really enjoyed you having you here tonight so good night to you and may you have a lovely evening further with your husband thank you so much lunga lots of love to you and saski and the team okay thank you so much good night okay bye well there you have it from me ladies and gents and that's where you have it for miss kim clutter there you can find her out we got we dropped the information find her on facebook on as well as twitter and as well as instagram and we gave you her email address so that you can book her there as well. That's it for me, ladies and gents. I got to go to a gig right now. If you want to follow me, not follow me just yet, you can catch me at Lunga Chuka the Energizer Funny on Facebook. That's Lunga Chuka the Energizer Funny. On Instagram, you can catch me at Lunga Chuka. And if you're looking for specific snippets of The Price of Fame, you can catch it also on Instagram at The Price of Fame ZA. That is The Price of Fame ZA. For those of you who prefer, the audio version of the podcast, you can catch it either on Apple, Spotify, as well as Anchor FM. And like you witnessed in the beginning of the interview, if you want to uh, participate and ask a question to our guests, go on to Anchor FM, send us a voice note, and we'll play your question in the interview. That's about it from me tonight, ladies and gents. Like I said, I'm off. My name is Lunga Chuka. I've been your host. Good night. This is The Price of Fame.